Um, so uh, laughter, who cares about laughter? Well, laughter actually has been studied for about 2000 years, at least in Western uh, tradition, uh, who knows about Chinese, um, uh, by people like, uh, from the philosopher, it started just being a philosopher uh, topic, uh, Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, Kant, Schopenhauer, Bergson, uh, Beattie, who I should mention too, I guess. Um, and the writers, all the important French writers, Stendhal, Baudelaire, and of course, uh, Sigmund Freud. Uh, I'd say the modern era you, is, is Darwin's uh, great book, The Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Uh, recently, there's much interest by social psychologists, biologists, and by neuroscientists, since in contrast to um, what we call verbal signals, uh, there's significant evidence for continuity with apes, um, and laughter begins at a much earlier stage than verbal signals with infants, uh, which we'll talk about a bit later. And arguably it even goes back to, to rats. Um, and so, in, in fact, rat laughter is actually sounds much more uh, human than uh, ape laughter, bizarrely enough. Um, so these are the people who've cared about laughter so far. Uh, who hasn't cared about laughter so far? Well, that's actually a linguist, uh, or at least a formal uh, grammarians. So even though laughter is pervasive in conversation, uh, so in the British National Corpus, for instance, that on average once every 14 turns, and there's a fair, 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 fairly wide uh, variation uh, across corpora from 5.8 per 10 minutes to 57 per 10 minutes of conversation. Um, a crucial assumption in the literature, usually implicit, uh, has been that laughter doesn't have propositional content. Um, and so basically the, the idea has been that laughter um, and smiling and sighing and so on, frowning, have a very different meaning from what one might call word-based language that is used to grossly speaking, uh, ask questions, gives answers, make commands, greet and part and so on. So it's kind of a different, on a different level. So that's why um, syntacticians, semanticists uh, didn't, didn't uh, uh, find laughter a relevant topic. So I'll very briefly summarize some, some recent work, a paper by, uh, that we uh, uh, got recently published in, in, in the journal of Glossa, uh, which is a, a so we've uh, the real uh, journal of general linguistics, uh, which is part of the title of this talk today. Um, and I, since I don't have time to, to you know, really summarize the paper, these are some of the basic issues we, we deal with. So the basic issue is does laughter and, and generally nonverbal social signals like smiling, frowning, sighing, eye rolling have propositional content? Is it input to pragmatic processes like irony and privilege and repair? And the answers to both of these questions is yes. Is, it, uh, is laughter qualitatively less under intentional control than verbal communication? The answer is no. Uh, does laughter interact with spoken, la spoken language? The answer is yes. Uh, does adding it into the segment of Spanish pragmatics require major changes? No, but it requires recognition that utterances, uh, not contents, are the input to semantic uh, pragmatic processes. Um, and should we add, add laughter into the grammar? Well, it's a complex answer, but probably yes, at least uh, on a kind of dialogical uh, view of grammar. So I'll just give you some, just a very quick sample of, 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 of the, the, the kind of uh, issues uh, of why we think that, that laughter should, should be analyzed by, by semantics and pragmatists. Um, so laughter, for instance, can, ha can have standalone uh, uh, uses and it can be used as an intra utterance particle. So this sign that you see that you've, you must remember from a few years ago in the Metro, come on banquier me dit qu'il prend soin de mon épaule. And here you see a bunch of orangutans laughing and the obvious uh, deduction that you make from this is, this is, you know, if somebody takes you, tells you a particular banker uh, that he'll take care of your savings and, you, and somebody else laughs, then, then the laughter expresses disbelief. Um, then, and of course, there's the famous uh, uh, exchange between God and Abraham in Genesis, where God tells Abraham that he's going to be a father at the age of 99, and Abraham laughs and falls on his face. Um, and here's another example uh, that sadly I forgot to include the, the, the recording, but uh, it's from a recent uh, press conference with the Bayern Munich uh, goalkeeper, uh, Manuel Neuer, um, who uh, after his team's uh, Dreierkette defense had proven pr uh, problematic in the game just played, a uh, journalist asks, um, Dreierkette auch an Option? Uh, is a three in the back defense an option? And he starts laughing. Uh, communicating, therefore, that it's not. So it's a way of communicating no. Um, so that's examples of standalone utterances, uh, laughter standalone utterances. And here we have laughter as um, an, an, a within an uh, utterance, uh, utter, uh, um, 
within utterance and where it actually affects the syntax. So, so it interacts with the syntax, different positions uh, mean that they're different uh, meanings. So if I say Jill is John's <laughs> long-term friend, then I'm scare quoting this whole phrase in principle. Whereas if I say she's John's long-term <laughs> friend, then I'm only scare quoting uh, the friend. Um, and this, uh, these kind of data you can you can do with other kinds of not just with laughter. You can do these things with winking and with sighing and with crying. Um, so basically, what, what we end up doing is we, we postulate two basic meanings for laughter. Uh, one is a relationship, a pleasantness relationship between uh, the laughable, the thing that, that that triggers the laugh, and the speaker. Um, another, uh, an congruous incongruity meaning um, which uh, where which means that laughter can express that a certain um, uh, thing that we perceive certain event is uh, incongruous uh, relative to uh, some uh, some um, topos uh, tau where topos is the Aristotle uh, Aristotelian notion of uh, basically a, a defeasible uh, assumption um, so, uh, and it represents some notion of, of congruity. So for pleasantness, we build on existing work in cognitive psychology and artificial intelligence to add into dialogue context outputs of uh, appraisal reasoning or emotional construction. And on the basis of these two basic, these two basic meanings, uh, we deduce an unbounded range of inferences that laughter can get, give rise to. Okay, so that's the basic um, sort of theoretical setup. But of course, uh, this is the Labex EFL, so we're not just supposed to do theory. We're supposed to, uh, you know, uh, check uh, and uh, check experimentally um, uh, what we're doing. So um, I'll uh, mention a, a couple of uh, works in this respect. First is laughter in the wild. So to what extent is this is this setup that we have of laughter um, something that it can can really be uh, 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 tested in a corpus? Well, a recent paper uh, that uh, Chiara Mazzucconi was the first author of um, in Transactions of Effective Computing. So uh, we exactly tested uh, the, the theory there um, and developed a taxonomy uh, for functions of laughter, um, which here you see the um, uh, decision tree for, and it basically involves three uh, meanings uh, three sub meaning, four sub meanings, uh, so th three sub meanings for the incongruity, pleasant incongruity, social incongruity, and pragmatic incongruity, and one uh, for the pleasantness. And we check this on, uh, on the, the uh, corpus consisting of about 1,000, uh, 1,072 laughs, um, 300 of them from the British National Corpus, 560 in French, and 200 in Chinese, uh, these coming from the dual corpus that we had uh, constructed here. And we have a high coverage uh, using this decision tree. And interestingly, again, for, for grammarians, um, we show that there's statistically different, uh, significant differences between the three languages regarding the positioning of laughter in relation to, the, to its laughable. So the position, so different languages place the laughter potentially in different places. Um, so that's um, one study that we did to, to um, validate the basic theory. Um, and then as far as laughter goes, um, the, the ontogeny of laughter, which as I mentioned at the beginning is, is what makes one of the interesting aspects of laughter that people, that infants start laughing at about between three and five months. So this is a recent work uh, presented at the laughter workshop uh, they see on the online in, in, in Bielefeld or Bielefeld by Zoom. Um, and so laughter is an early means to engage in proto conversation, uh, practicing turn taking. And in particular, it's a signal of early awareness of others' mental states. So uh, arguably it gives evidence that, that there's a potential of, of, of theory of mind from you know, uh, much earlier than has been assumed uh, if you just uh, use uh, manual gestures. Um, so, uh, we the, the study that, that we made used the Providence corpus uh, for uh, children, uh, two females, two males, uh, from 12 uh, uh, year, uh, months to 36 months, uh, 30 minutes each um, each uh, study period. And very briefly, uh, you can see here the evolution of the um, of the uses. Um, initially, uh, laughter primarily laughter for enjoyment. Um, 
and uh, then uh, we have uh, laughter for um, um, hmm, uh, for marking incongruity, and uh, by 24 months uh, for uh, expressing affiliation, and um, eventually um, the, the last uh, use of laughter that emerges is uh, social uh, social laughter for smoothing uh, certain kind of uh, social incongruities. So that's just a, a snippet of, of this work. Um, and then I'll, I'll move to the final uh, piece of work that we did, which concerns laughter and aging. So um, laughter is preserved even in quite advanced dementia. Um, so for instance, forgetting can trigger laughter. So here's a study that uh, was done by uh, in Sweden, in some care homes in Sweden, where um, carers were uh, dealing with um, with old people and trying to, to, to trigger them to remember certain kinds of uh, sayings. So here the, the, the patient um, doesn't manage to remember how to complete this saying, and then he starts laughing. Um, so the question is, is how does this, you know, how do we uh, explain the preservation of laughter and dementia uh, involving quite intricate uh, inferences, even when uh, the uh, various issues with uh, long-term uh, memory. Um, so this led us to some other work that we've done on synthesizing dialogue context and memory. Um, so this is work uh, that, that uh, I, I did with um, Andy Looking, who's going to talk a bit later on laughter. So this is a, a work we presented this, this year on laughter and forgetting and conserving. <laughs> um, so basically um, here, as you, I'm sure you all, uh, all, all of you know uh, about memory or haven't forgotten about uh, your, your studies about memory, the two basic systems, a long-term system and a working memory system, um, most famously uh, a work by uh, Bagley, which uh, looks at um, uh, working memory in terms of uh, uh, this basic uh, structure that you see here. There's an episodic buffer, uh, some, a visual spatial sketch pad, which is for visual triggers and a phonological loop for linguistic ones and a, a central executive. Central executive. So we re, um, we uh, uh, re-implemented this model uh, using our model of, of dialogue. And again, the details are not particularly important now, but um, this has triggered a, for us a, a new theory of dialogue that is kind of tries to, um, to, to be very uh, uh, close to uh, existing theories of uh, memory. And then on the basis of this, we can try and explain examples like this. Here you see in this example, you see Vladimir Putin entering a, a hospital wearing a hazmat suit. Um, so if you have, uh, you know, both of you are sitting on a, on a couch watching TV and you see Putin start laughing. Um, so then we can uh, try to, to, to give a formal explanation of uh, how this uh, all works. Uh, how the laughter, that A's laughter works and how B interprets A's laughter relative to this uh, visual, uh, visual um, stimulus. Um, so again, I won't go into the details unless you, you want me to go to the, into them afterwards. But the basic idea is that the, various, um, the, the model that we built can, can explain both how the, the various contextual parameters of the laugh uh, operate and in particular, the, the, the accessing of the, um, the diffusible inference that the reason for the laugh is essentially that there's a clash between the visual signal and the diffusible signal that presidents uh, wear formal suits. Okay, so future work, we're going to uh, hopefully extend this work into laughter among dementia sufferers. And also um, we have a planned collaboration with the studies of laughter, of laughter and schizophrenia. Um, Kara has now started to work on analyzing uh, a, a corpus that was compiled in uh, Ex Marseille uh, that, that already has, that has laughter and has already various physiological data there in the corpus. And another uh, piece of work we're hoping to do in, in the not too distant future, uh, funding uh, permitting, of course, is developing a, an embodied computational agent that could do uh, speech laughter. Okay, so um, I'll uh, be happy to take any questions now.